you for for having me and thank you for this invitation and uh, i think it's important that you recognize the importance of this particular topic um and those of you who are familiar with the theory in psychiatry you will know that women are more vulnerable to certain types of psychiatric disorders right men are vulnerable to certain psychiatric disorders and this affects women globally not just in sri lanka now this peripartum period is a point of time where this vulnerability to develop psychiatric conditions or disorders is very high in women now i'm someone who works i am i have a particular interest in mental health of women so this is uh, something even in the clinical practice we see right so peripartum period is a very vulnerable time for women globally regardless of age sex country okay of course certain certain uh, peripartum postpartum disorders are more common in certain social classes we'll discuss about that as we as we move along now except for the medical students uh, i think the majority of you who are working as doctors you must be a mother or a father to a child and if you go back to the point of time where you welcomed your child to this world it's a very joyous and you know it's an exciting time you will quickly write down the time of birth then you quickly go and get the horoscope sorted are you running here and there trying to um, get the name sorted okay yeah so yes so it's a very joyous and a very exciting time i was also excited and i had my children and everybody in the family is excited so it's it's you expect the mother to be super happy okay okay people are struggling without children now when you have a child you expect the mother to continue to be extremely happy during the period of time that follows the birth of the child but this doesn't always happen for some women they undergo this terribly disabling condition called postpartum psychiatric disorders there are few conditions that are that come together to form the postpartum disorders and for these women the quality of life is horrible okay you must have in your practice spoken to women who previously or currently suffering from postpartum disorders and what they tell you is not pleasant at all okay so what we are going to fo be focusing today is three main conditions there are minor conditions which i don't think you should worry about too much postpartum blues postpartum psychosis and postpartum depression so we'll touch on all three each one is different to the other one okay and uh, the implications or the what follows is very important because the prognosis of the three are different so be very clear that these are three separate conditions okay we sometimes just tend to loosely use these words but you must be careful when you use these terms to which condition exactly you are using this term for okay so let's focus on how common they are right so i would say about now these are from various global data you can see if you look at the yellow part this of course is very variable but approximately 30 to 50 percent of women huge range right 20 to 50 percent may not have any mood problems can you see the blue part right this baby blues i think in sri lanka estimates states about 80 percent is quite a prevalent condition that mothers suffer from then you know if you look at the orange part postnatal depression if you remember the mcqs that we did this was the first one in sri lanka it's about 10 to 20 percent so it's not as much as the blues but it's quite significant and i don't know if you can see there's a small thin red line between the yellow and the orange that is postnatal 
psychosis or postpartum psychosis. Can you see it's very rare? Okay, so it's not as common as the other two. So in my clinical experience of 14 years now in psychiatry, um, I have seen maybe 10, not more than that. Okay, because it's quite rare. Okay, so let's focus on the commoner one, these baby blues. What is being blue? Do you understand this word blue? It's, it's a Western word. People in the West use it. Blues indicates um, when you're feeling sad, when you're feeling a bit down, you sometimes say, I'm feeling blue. Right? So that's how this baby blues, because this feeling low is associated with having a baby. You call it baby blues. And experienced by most of the women who give birth, right? To some extent, which I think I must agree with. Those of you who were moms, if you go back to your immediate um, postpartum period, I'm sure some of us have you know, felt some of these symptoms. Okay, like I said, it's about, it's a lot of studies vary, but as much as 85% of women can experience this, it comes within the first 10 days. Within the first 10 days, let's say two weeks. Okay. Very rarely does it come up. I would say it never comes two weeks later. Starts from the first day, peaks on the third to fifth day and gradually fades away. Right? Okay. What are the symptoms? This is how we feel on a Friday evening sometimes, isn't it? So very common, very vague, non-specific symptoms, mood swings, anxiety, sadness, irritability, feeling overwhelmed for the sake of the medical student, I'll just explain. Feeling, over, feeling overwhelmed means you feel that you can't cope. So much going on in your life, so much of responsibilities, and even though you are fully capable of coping up, you feel that you can't cope up and you feel overwhelmed with all the responsibilities, crying, can't concentrate, problems with appetite, problems with sleep. Now, what happens is, we think that this is anyway part of being a new mother. Right? So these things are not picked up. You attribute it to, you think that every mom is it's normal to feel like. Okay, which is not really true. But having said that, postpartum blues or postnatal blues doesn't interfere with your functioning, your social or your occupational functioning. It won't affect your relationships with your rest of the family or your other social connections, work colleagues, other relations, friends, husband. It doesn't affect to a major degree that you are seen as dysfunctional. That doesn't happen and you can generally do your job then if you some some mothers have to go to work immediately, right? So you can do your stuff and your responsibility is at home. It doesn't make you dysfunctional. That's the important point. And also it's self-limiting. You know what self-limiting means? It's a bit like a hembrisa. It's very common. Right? You don't have to go running. Do we go running to a physician every time you have a common cold? No, you know that within three to five days it will resolve on its own. So similarly, postpartum blues, uh, you don't need to actively intervene and, you know, bring them to a psychiatrist or get her admitted or anything like that. Usually with support and reassurance from family, this condition automatically goes away. But... Um, there are certain times, right? If it is going on for more than two weeks, if the postpartum blues gets dragged on and on for two weeks or more, then you have to be careful because this female might get pushed to a more serious psychiatric condition like a postpartum depression. Okay. And we think that postpartum blues or postnatal blues is due to sudden drop in hormonal levels and of course the huge amount of stress 
that is accompanied following delivery because it's a new responsibility for this mother particularly if it is the first born baby um, so that's what we think it may be due to okay right hope that part is clear yes we can always come back and clarify things so that is postpartum blues you know it's very very common starts within the first 10 days peaks in the third to fifth day doesn't affect your social law occupational functioning so much and you it's self-limiting generally goes away with reassurance and some extra support but if it's going on for more than two weeks it may progress to a serious psychiatric condition. few bullet points to remember okay yeah so now let's move to another important one, which is the postpartum psychosis. Now this one, if you remember, is quite rare. I told you it's quite rare. About maximum 1%. So 0.1 to 1% of new mothers. And it comes also within the first two weeks following childbirth. And the onset is very quick. Whereas postpartum blues is very gradual and the symptoms are very different. This one, the onset is very quick and the symptoms are very severe so that your social and occupational functioning is not happening as desired. Okay. And so how do you recognize this? There can be mood symptoms. There can be psychotic symptoms, both mixed together. Mood is generally, if, if a mood symptom is included, it is generally on the elevated side. Elevated mood rather than a depressed mood. Do you see in depression, right? This is, this is lability of mood, not ability. Lability means your mood fluctuates. This way, that way. The correct term is lability of affect. Your effect is the thing that is labile, but just remember that these females are very labile. At one point, they'll be laughing. Another point, they'll be crying. Next minute, they'll get angry. Next minute, they get agitated. Then again, they will settle down. So very labile. Right? Right? Rambling speech, rambling speech, you can't really make sense. They go on talking, not very clear what they are saying. And very, very disorganized. They will you know, uh, do bizarre things. They will rip off their clothes. They will shout. They will hoot. They will run. They will throw things. So very, very um, chaotic mother can it. This is a very chaotic um, elevated in mood, very disorganized, chaotic woman who is um, uh, presenting within the first two weeks. Generally, it doesn't really go into three weeks. This is postpartum psychosis. Okay. And of course, the important thing is they have hallucinations, that is, having perceptions without a stimulus. The commonest hallucination is auditory hallucinations. They can hear things. Second person auditory hallucinations. People are commanding. People are talking to them directly. And you know what a delusion is? A delusion is a firmly held fixed false belief, which is not in keeping with the rest of the cultural or religious background. And you can't um, negotiate with the patient. It's, it's unshakable this belief so we'll see what some of the hallucinations and delusions are sometimes the delusion is about the child they may say this is is this child is possessed by the devil or they will say this is some uh, god's child or that it's a divine child divine can have something to do with gods like maybe they can right sometimes they say this child is not a live child this is a dead child the dangerous thing about postpartum psychosis is secondary to these hallucinations and delusions, they are high-risk mothers. High risk. Right? High risk of what? High risk of infanticide that is killing your own child. 
followed by suicide. So it's an infanticide suicide um, combination that happens, right? Or you may have just suicide, you may have just infanticide, usually the two are interconnected and you can see it's not something you can ignore because it's five percent suicide rate, four percent infanticide rate. So therefore if you suspect postpartum psychosis, it's very difficult to establish a rapport with the patient because the patient is very chaotic. You can't really build up a conversation with the patient but it's very important to inquire. Some patients may not be that extreme if you catch them in the early period please ask about suicidal and infanticidal thoughts because sometimes, particularly if the, if the mother thinks that this child is the devil's child or a dead child, they may throw the child or, you know, kill the child or bury the child, throw them into the well, throw them out of, I don't know, wherever, or strangle the neck of the child simply because the, the act is secondary to these psychotic symptoms. So that is why postpartum psychosis, mothers with postpartum psychosis need to be in hospital. You can't manage a postpartum psychosis patient at home under the best of medical care. Right? You cannot do it. You need to bring postpartum mothers to the hospital because although it may be at an early stage, they can very quickly develop. Remember, it's a very aggressive condition may be okay in the morning but towards evening become psychotic and have delusions and then behave in a very dangerous way to the child and herself okay so depending on what the symptoms are they may need antipsychotics they may need mood stabilizers leave it to the psychiatrists right um they will handle it um postpartum psychosis responds very well to ect right and if you bring the patient early, the prognosis is quite good within this pregnancy. They quickly respond. But if you have postpartum psychosis in this pregnancy, very likely that in the next pregnancy also, they will have postpartum psychosis. Unfortunately, that's how it happens. Okay. So risk factors, surprisingly, Postpartum psychosis is seen, is seen in primates. People with a past history of bipolar, right, or a past history of any schizophrenia or the psychotic illness, past history of postpartum psychosis, having a family history of postpartum bipolar disorders, right, if you discontinue your treatment, if the infant has died, if the mother is sleep deprived and lack of partner support now, you may think that in Sri Lanka, our partners are not very supportive. But um, actually, it's worse in the West. And they don't have much partner support. And um, there's a huge population of single mothers in the West, as you know, without much partner support. So actually, these things are more in the West, which is probably why we don't see so many in our community so these are the risk factors keep this in mind i will send you this presentation if you think if you want it so don't try to remember everything all at once right our next one is postpartum depression okay if you remember it's a mood disorder so the primary clinical feature is a low mood right affects women after childbirth so it's just like any other depression. Postpartum depression is not some special depression with special set of symptoms. It is depression, but it happens in the postpartum period. So the bonding is severely affected. We'll see why bonding is affected. And what is this postpartum period when it comes to, yeah, this is what I mentioned. The surprising thing is, Usually it comes after two weeks, but of course it can start any time after delivery, generally after two weeks. And you'll be surprised that it can last up to a year. So until the Baba's first birthday, at any point during that one year, they can develop postpartum depression. Okay, so it's not just in the early phase. You know it's about 10 to 20%. Why? 
we are not sure why it happens in the postpartum period so much. So just to give you an idea, right? Depression in women in the community is about eight to 10%. But in postpartum, you can see that it's almost double. So postpartum period, like I mentioned in the first slide, very, very vulnerable, particularly for this postpartum, double the risk that a non-pregnant woman in the community has of developing depression. It's clear. Right? So we think that it's due to physical and emotional factors. Like in the blues, we think the sudden fluctuation of estrogen and progesterone dropping may be responsible. Um, we don't know for sure. Mm, and we also think that, you know, if you remember what it was like, ladies, you, you can't sleep. I mean, you have to forget about sleeping. And you know that constant sleep deprivation makes you exhausted, right? And um, you are meanwhile trying to recover from your cesarean or your um, whatever the discomforts you may have had following a vaginal delivery. So you had to recover from that. You don't get a break, right? You are physically having aches and pains. Your body has changed dramatically. So we think that it's a combination of these two, but okay, let's remind ourselves of the features. You know what depression features are, but particularly in postpartum depression, please remember, right? Depressed mood that you all know, crying, difficulty bonding with your baby. You can't bond on an emotional level with your child because when you're depressed, nothing gives you pleasure. Even your child doesn't give you any pleasure, right? Either they will, so you're withdrawn, you're very isolated, okay? Loss of appetite or you eat too much, inability to sleep or sleeping too much, feeling tired, no energy, no interest, no pleasure, irritable, angry, and this fear, this um, doubt about yourself that you're not a good mom, feeling hopeless, worthless so it's very similar to the depressions that you will usually see okay you have panic attacks comorbid and then of course don't think that postpartum depression is not dangerous right they also have thoughts of harming yourself and the baby so infanticide and suicide can occur even in postpartum depression these are the features but remember there are now, if you remember, it's about 10 to 20 percent. It's not 80 percent like the blues. Blues, about 80 percent to 85 percent will happen. But postpartum depression, only how much? 10 to 20 percent maximum. So, therefore, only some women have this vulnerability to develop postpartum depression. Okay, who are they? If you have had depression during or after the previous pregnancy, if you have had depression or bipolar in the past when you were not pregnant, okay, family member who has had depression or any other mental illness, particularly affective disorders like depression or bipolar, these are the ladies who are more vulnerable. Hope it's clear. Then, if you have had a severely stressful life event, soon after you gave birth, let's say there are some other stressors in your life, like somebody close to you dies, or you have some illness, right, or some issue at work. So, soon, so one after the other, soon after the birth, if you are having some negative life event, then you are more vulnerable. If you have had complications at childbirth, premature, or a baby is having various medical surgical problems, right? Unplanned pregnancies, okay? And mixed feelings about the pregnancy from the start, then you are more vulnerable. And if you have an emotionally unsupportive partner or family or friends, then obviously you are more vulnerable. Sri Lanka, this is not so much of a problem. Alcohol, drug abuse issues are not much of a problem, but we do see mothers who are um, um, 
not so much in candy, but opioid dependent and alcohol dependent. Uh, so those issues are also there. Now remember, postpartum depression can affect any woman, regardless of age, race, ethnicity, or socioeconomic status. Right? Um, but newer research is showing that postpartum psychosis, postpartum depression is slightly higher in the lower socioeconomic status. I don't think we have a lot of data from Sri Lanka, but this is global data. So postpartum depression, they say, is about 25% in the lower socioeconomic countries. And we are a lower socioeconomic country. So you will see lots and lots of postpartum depression. Okay. Right. Have you heard of this lady, Tina Zahn? She, um, if you type Tina Zahn and you go to YouTube, there is actual footage of this lady driving. So she was in the postpartum period. She didn't know that she had postpartum depression. Nobody knew that she had postpartum depression, right? So she drove to a bridge. I forget it's in America. It's a famous bridge. It's one of the highest bridges. She drove the car and she just ran to the, to the edge of the bridge. This is that bridge in the background, right? And she tried to jump and fortunately they got some clue. I think the family noted uh, 911 and they were following her car. And she just, within seconds she jumped and you can see the footage, the police and the personnel just jumped just in time. Half her body was over the bridge and later she came back she recovered from her postpartum depression. She raised a beautiful child and she spoke. Um, she was a spokesperson. You know what a spokesperson is. So you, you, you encourage women to seek help if you have postpartum depression. And you have heard of Oprah Winfrey's famous chat, chat show where they, 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 they got this lady and she spoke very openly about it. And these are important in raising awareness in, in the community. It's, I think we are yet to, yet to go there because Still in Sri Lanka, there's a lot of stigma. People don't really come out and talk about um, any deficiencies, particularly when it comes to mental health. So this is just something when you have some time, go and see this Tina Zahn. Um, the, the video is there on YouTube. Okay, so I think postpartum blues is very easy, but I think some of you tend to get mixed up with postpartum depression and postpartum psychosis. Uh, postpartum depression, persistent low mood and comes very slowly. Patient herself may not realize mood. Whereas postpartum psychosis, the mood I told you is like a flame of the candle. It goes this way, that way, this way, that way. Very suddenly, very quickly. Usually in postpartum depression, unless the depression has gone to a severe extent, in all the women, you won't see delusions and hallucinations, whereas in postpartum psychosis, more often than not, psychotic symptoms, delusions, hallucinations are usually present. And postpartum depression, you can treat with medication and psychotherapy combination, right? Sometimes you can manage postpartum depression as an outpatient if the risk is not high and you have a system, there is a good good support from the family you can manage as an outpatient whereas can you manage postpartum psychosis at home no all postpartum psychosis patients even if it is an early stage we uh, we urge you to encourage hospitalization otherwise the risk is too high to mitigate at a home level and more often than not they definitely need medical treatment right and you know postpartum depression is about 20 percent Whereas you know that postpartum psychosis is 0.1 to 1%. Okay, so I think that's it because I wanted to finish off here. Now, if you are going to buy a gift for your, if you have a newborn, right? Now, of course, things are very expensive, but if you want to buy a very big gift, spending any amount of money, what is the biggest or best gift you can give for a newborn child? Is it something I ask mothers when, when I see them? What is the biggest gift? The biggest gift is a happy mother. Santo Singh in Namakene. That is the biggest gift you can give your child. 
okay and we don't realize this we disregard the importance of a happy mother the bonding that happens that is very very important please remember in postpartum disorders there are two lives here the mother and the child okay and children it has research has shown I, i'm repeating here but children who have had poor bonding or grew up with parents mothers who had depression during their infancy and early childhood they are slow learners they have attention deficit hyperactivity disorder adhd they have oppositional defiant disorder they have conduct disorder areas issues crop up later on so please don't underestimate the importance of a happy mother that is the biggest gift that you can give your child please spread the message to mothers that you see